Good morning. Welcome to this time of worship with First Baptist Church of Fort Payne, Alabama. I'm Marshall Henderson, the pastor of First Baptist Church. Our church exists because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we believe that the gospel is at the very heart of the message of the Bible, and it's at the very heart of who we are as God's people. It means that the gospel forms every part of our lives and it informs every dimension of who we are and what we do as God's people. So in light of the gospel, we live for the sake of Jesus Christ. And we desire as a church to make Jesus Christ known through heartfelt worship, through disciple making, through missional living, and through devoting ourselves to one another in community. So today, however you're watching, I want you to know that the desire of our leadership is that you enter into a genuine and heartfelt time of worship with us as a church. Jesus is worthy of our praise, and he is worthy of all of our attention and our affection. And now, for all who are weary and need rest, and for all who mourn and long for comfort, and for all who fail and desire strength, and for all who sin and need a Savior, this church opens wide its doors to you, you are welcomed into worship this morning with a welcome that comes from Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship. Well, good morning, and welcome into worship this morning with First Baptist Church of Fort Payne. Uh, if you're a guest with us this morning, uh, welcome. There is in the pew rack in front of you a guest information card. Uh, you can fill that out. You can drop that in the offering plate later on in the service. Uh, if we haven't met, I would love to meet you after the service, and I'm always right here afterward. Uh, also, if you're a guest and you have a young child going to children's church, there are name badges, uh, in the pew racks as well, uh, one part to fill out, one part to put on the child to send to Children's Church. They meet on the second floor, and they can be picked up on the second floor after the service. Also, if you don't have a bulletin this morning, you can grab one from the foyer. It will greatly help you as we worship together. So as we come into worship this morning, as always, we, we're here, we're gathered to turn all of our attention and all of our affection to Jesus Christ, and we do so in a, in a fairly unique way this morning. Uh, today is what we call Orphan Sunday. It's a reminder of our Lord's bold declaration that he is father to the fatherless. And it's a reminder of our call as Christians to, of what we are called to do and to care for. Uh, we're called to defend and care for the fatherless. Uh, so uh, uh, we honor orphans this morning because we believe that orphans, vulnerable children, are, are near to the heart of God. Uh, helping us this morning uh, is Tim Christ. I'll introduce him a little bit more later. He's from Lifeline Children's Services. Uh, Lifeline Children's Services, their mission is to come alongside a church like ours and to help us care for vulnerable children, to care for the orphans around us. Uh, so this morning, as we gather for worship, as we think about all these things together, we celebrate God's grace toward us as children, that we were once spiritual orphans. We are now adopted as children of God. 
Uh, and I think I've shared with this, with this with you before that, you know, these moments in worship, um, it's sort of like an image that always comes to my mind. I think about uh, how long married spouses look like one another. Like, we've talked about this before. Like, you know, everyone notices those people that you're like, were you, were you brother and sister? Because y'all look so much alike. Um, and I, I am from Mississippi, so, like, sometimes that is the explanation. But other times... Uh, anyway, in, you know, I always say this, in Mississippi, we make that joke about Arkansas. Uh, so uh, anyway, you know, so these spouses look like each other, and, and there's actually a study that was done that said spouses do begin to look like one another over a long period of time. They found it to be true, and it's from this. It's from the time spent looking into each other's faces. And so as you look, in, look at one another, as you speak, there's sort of this natural mimicking that happens with your face as you empathize with what they're saying, as you join in with what they're saying. And so your facial lines, the way you move your face, even facial muscles are shaped over time in similar ways. All that to say this. What we do when we gather for worship this morning is we are setting our gaze upon the face of our Lord. And so we look at the contours of his face, we see what the smile of God is, we trace his smile with our smiles. So that's what we're doing here. And so as we, say, as we gather this morning, we know that God uh, loves taking the orphan and putting the orphan in families. He loves giving strength to the weak. He loves redeeming those who are in the depths. That is the smile of the Lord. So for all who are weary and need rest, for all who mourn and long for comfort, for all who fail and desire strength from on high, and for all who sin and need a Savior. This church opens wide its doors to you with the welcome that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship this morning. As we begin our time of worship, I want to begin with a time of prayer. Uh, as you know, or as you might know, our students are away this morning at fall retreat. Uh, so in a, in a few minutes, they're going to begin their last session of worship. And I think the first song that we sing today is actually a song they'll be singing at fall retreat as well. And so, uh, so we want to we begin just by praying. We'll pray for them. We'll pray for us as we worship here. And after we, after we pray, I'll invite you to, to greet one another. But let's go ahead and stand together. Let's pray. And after we pray, we can pass the peace. Bow with me. Father in heaven, we lift up to you uh, those who are our congregation who are near this morning and who are far away. Father, we lift up to you our students who are away at a retreat. We pray this weekend has been for their rest and for their renewal. We pray it's been for honest and heartfelt worship. Lord, our prayer for them even this morning as they gather for worship that they would encounter Christ through the scriptures and he would transform their heart and their will. Father, we pray for their leaders, uh, for Ryan who gives uh, his life and his ministry to them. We pray for growth and relationships with one, with one another. Father, for sins to come to the surface, to, for them to be repented of, just for memorable moments and spiritual milestones. And Father, as they return back home later this morning, we pray for their families to continue to press in and spur them on in their journey of following Jesus. Now, Lord, as we gather for worship, we are here. We pray that we will be open to you and everything. We pray that we'd encounter Christ in a fresh way. We pray that we'd say yes to all that you call us to and every strength that you've given us. We pray that we'd find our strength in you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Would you welcome one another?
As you finish greeting those that are around you, we'll begin our worship. You heard Dr. Marshall say that our students are, in fact, opening their worship uh, almost as we do as well. Um, uh, so we begin with Crown Him with Many Crowns. Please stand. Let's sing together uh, uh, this great hymn. <laughs> Boys and girls, I'd like for you to look at the screen and have a couple, several pictures up here for you to look at and see if you can figure out what is needed in these pictures or what the problem might be. So if you look at the first picture, it looks like someone needs some new shoes, right? Okay, and what about the, the little boy at the table? Maybe he needs some food. And then there's a boy with a skin knee. Have any of you ever been there? You ever had skin knee? What did you need? You needed a Band-Aid. That's right. Band-Aids cure everything, don't they? So pretend for a moment that you're the person who needs new shoes, or you need food, or you need a Band-Aid. And suppose someone comes up to you and says, well, I hope you get new shoes or I hope you get food, or I hope you get a Band-Aid, and then they just walk off. 
Did that help you at all? No. How would that make you feel? Probably not great, would it? The Bible tells us in James chapter 2 that our faith should be active and that we should do good works for others. Now, doing good works does not save us from our sin. It does not make us right with God. Only accepting God's gift of salvation and forgiveness through Jesus' death on the cross can make us right with God and can save us from our sin. But once we're saved, we should love and help others. Our faith should be alive. And Matthew 25 tells us that as we help others, we're also loving and serving Jesus himself. Verses 34 through 40 say, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and your care for us. Father, we thank you that you meet our needs, Father, spiritually and physically. Lord, you you care for the vulnerable. Lord, you care for all of us. And we just thank you for sending Jesus to die for our sins. And Father, help us to share your love with others. Help us to see needs around us and to meet them with your love. In Jesus' name, amen.
When shall I see that happy place and be forever blessed? When shall I see my father's face and in his glory? Continue with our worship, we find ourselves in a holiday period for the next uh, weeks. We're about to uh, celebrate Advent and Christmas, uh, but first we have this uh, time where our families are going to gather. So we sing a song here next, uh, and then Robin will follow that with a song that talks about the season, this period of time uh, where we find ourselves uh, in worship uh, and in life. So we first uh, sing just a stanza and the chorus of Like a River Glorious. Remain seated, though, first, and then Robin will come and sing about every season.
even when the trees have just surrendered to the harvest time forfeiting their leaves in late September and sending us inside and still I notice you and change begins and I Robin. As we continue our worship, we sing now, uh, How Deep the Father's Love. I'll ask that you stand again, and uh, we'll join our voices together.
remain standing for just a moment. We'll have our scripture reading. Uh, but children, you are dismissed to Children's Church at this time. Our scripture reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let me introduce uh, Tim Chris to you. Uh, Tim is from Lifeline Children's Services. special guest speaker for us this morning. Uh, It says in his bio online, uh, originally from Ohio, Tim and his family live in Sylacauga, Alabama, which is about an hour south of Birmingham. Tim received his BA in leadership ministries from Southeastern Bible College and his certificate in pastoral leadership from Sanford University's Ministry Training Institute. Uh, Tim's role as the manager of church partnerships is to assist Lifeline in engaging local churches and ministry partners in creating disciples among the nations and embracing orphan care ministries in their community. And Tim finds joy in cooking, yard work, and weekend getaways. His favorite traveling companions include his wife and their three children, although Tim is here stag with us uh, this morning. Uh, Tim, come and share with us. Thanks for being here. Oh, well, good morning. Good morning. It is so good to be with you this morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Marshall, for the opportunity to come and to share with you a little bit about Lifeline and, uh, and, and just what we get to do, which it is absolutely a privilege to be able to do this. Our mission at Lifeline uh, is to, um, to equip the body of Christ to manifest the gospel to vulnerable children uh, and, and to their families. And so this is, this is a big fancy way of saying that we want to make sure you have all the resources you need to care for Uh, orphans, kids in foster care, foster families, and the families of the kids that may be in foster care as well. And so uh, our vision as a ministry is that vulnerable children and their communities are transformed by the gospel and are making disciples. Um, That is is our hope uh, through the ministry that we have and through equipping uh, the local body of Christ as well. We began in 1981 as a ministry in Birmingham uh, as a pregnancy counseling ministry, actually, for uh, those that, that, that found themselves in an unexpected pregnancy. Uh, so in 1981, the Lord kind of laid a vision upon the heart of a couple of, a couple of guys in Birmingham to begin this ministry. And as we began that ministry uh, in 1981, realizing we're trying to coach and encourage moms and dads to life-giving decisions for their baby. In doing so, realized that there was not a good option, a gospel-centered option for those moms and dads that decided, yes, I want to give my child life, but I cannot parent. And so just a few short years after um, we began this, this calling and the realization was placed that we needed to begin an adoption ministry. And so we did. We began domestic adoption uh, shortly after um, pregnancy counseling, the whole ministry started up, and that pregnancy counseling ministry you may uh, have heard of uh, today as well, um, it's, it's where Save a Life began, uh, the ministries of Save a Life, and so we're thankful that that has continued on, uh, and in coaching ladies and, and moms and dads both in, in the gospel and in life-giving decisions, but with that domestic adoption uh, component as well that Lifeline brought on board, uh, we, we, in doing this, realized there was also a need uh, amongst uh, the, the church. The church is asking for international adoption, specifically in China. Uh, so, so just a few short years after the domestic adoption program, China became our first international adoption program. Today we have 17 international programs uh, that are open and ready for, uh, for Christians, Christian families, to seek adoption of a child or a sibling group of children. Uh, and so through that, we have, we have grown in, in, into these 17 countries, and we have three more on deck. 
Uh, and then following that, we've got another three that are on deck. So Lord willing, uh, at the end of 2023, uh, we could see 23 international programs, which would just be a tremendous blessing and what an honor it has been. We, we get to, to do this with moms and dads. It's not something that we, we see as a burden. We see it as a great discipleship opportunity to walk with moms and dads through this, this journey <clears throat> excuse me, of adoption. It is full of hills and valleys. It's full uh, of, uh, of struggles. It's full of spiritual warfare. And I will tell you that it is so helpful to have someone alongside you who's going to encourage you uh, who is also going to to pray with you and walk beside you and to answer the questions that may come up because over the course of an adoption process, which could be um, <clears throat> one, two, three, five years, you can imagine you'd have a lot of questions that may come up. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also uh, have a family restoration program. So we've got pregnancy counseling, we've got domestic interna international adoption, and family restoration is a way of saying foster care and foster care related ministries. And so uh, we, be, we began teaching the tips classes for foster care, foster parents, prospective parents that were looking into becoming foster parents. <clears throat> and we partnered with a few counties across the state to be able to teach those classes in place of DHR teaching them where we can infuse those classes with the word of God and with the gospel. And we're so thankful to be able to do that. We don't license those parents though. We hand them over to the local uh, local DHR office, and we encourage those parents that now, as you are licensed and you are, or as you are are trained and you are equipped, and you're going to make this a ministry, make this your mission field. Um, my wife and I um, are foster parents. We've been foster parents for three years. Over that course of time, we have seen um, 15, 15 kids through our home in three years. Um, and so we, we take that call seriously to not only be missionaries to the kids, but to be missionaries to DHR as well. Uh, in family restoration, two things I really want to kind of, kind of camp out on in conversations with Marshall. I understand that your church is so um, wonderfully involved in caring for those that are in foster care, caring for foster families in the community and through adoption. But we've got two areas in, in family restoration that, that really stand out to to me and to others as we talk through the ministry of Lifeline. One of those is a parenting class for, oh, thank you. <laughs> what a great relief. Thank you so much. It is something about this season, isn't it? <clears throat> when you go from 80 to 40 overnight, it's no fun. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, so... Um, in, in family restoration, you've got these kids that are coming into foster care. These kids are coming from somewhere. They're coming from a family, a family that has, has either been in, it's in jeopardy of breaking up or has already broken up. And now uh, what we have, have developed is we have an opportunity for the church to pour into those families. So as we looked at the scope of foster care, what is it, what is in, what's involved in it, where, where are ministries happening, where are holes Gaps in the ministry happening. We saw, we saw ministries that were formulated for foster families that were doing foster care. We saw ministries that were aimed at the children in foster care. But what we, what we saw missing was this giant hole right in the center that there was no ministry to mom and dad who have lost custody of their kids. And so the goal in more than half of the cases of foster care is reconciliation for that, those kids to go back home to mom and dad, where rightfully they should be in, in the right circumstances. What we noticed was that kids that were going back home, though, were going back home to the same things that got them placed in care in the first place. Approximately, just under 40% of the kids that enter foster care will be right back in the system within three years. That's a devastating number when we stop and think about that. And we're going to talk some more about that in just a moment. But the family restoration piece that we have that we have equipped is, or we have developed is called Families Count. We'll highlight that just a, just a second. Um, the other areas that we have in ministry, we've got a global orphan care ministry that is partnering with churches that are doing ministry in their own backyard uh, in an international context. And so. Uh, we want to come alongside them strategically to say, hey, we want to make sure you're properly equipped for caring for vulnerable children because there's a way to do that and there's a way to not do that. Uh, we want to make sure that these, these folks understand trauma, which is trauma is a, a way of saying our brain, how does our brain process what has happened to us? 
and oftentimes in trauma there are disconnections in the brain that happens and we want to make sure that those wires are put back together uh, properly in the right place. So Global Orphan Care is a strategic uh, partnership ministry that we have connecting uh, U.S. churches to international churches and then the last thing, education and counseling that we have that, that seeks to go, go to moms and dads that are, and families that are involved in foster care or involved in adoption and say, hey, here are resources for you. This is, this is hard stuff. And I'll tell you, uh, uh, just as a personal testimony, I have, um, I have utilized some of these resources. I have, I have laughed at some of these resources only to go back to that person and say, okay, it worked. So it does work. It's trauma that, that, that we need to understand is it, it, when those connections get, get broken, how are they put back together? And when, they're, when we try to equip these kids to put them back together the right way, then it, then it changes their world. It changes our world as parents as well. So the first, um, that, that next slide, the first ministry I was telling you about, uh, so, oh, sorry, I forgot the statistic slides in there first. Uh, let, me, let me show you some, some, easy for me to say, show you some statistics from right here um, in your home county. There are 119 kids in foster care is the, the most updated number that I had. It may be a little old, so that could fluctuate one or two. We also have, um, next one, next point is three children waiting for adoption in the county. Three children where their rights, their parental rights have been terminated. And we have 51 licensed foster homes to care for 119 kids in care. That's a huge gap, is it not? Wait till you see this one. 50 family preservation cases. This is 50 families that are on the verge of breaking up because of some decision of mom and dad. But there is a plan in place to help these families stay together. We're going to talk about how to do that. There are 96 churches. Out of 96 churches, 51 licensed foster homes. And when we read scripture, we see that that discrepancy should never be. That is a huge gap between 96 churches, 51 homes, 119 kids in care. So these 50 family preservation cases and these 119 kids in care, let's just say on average it's two kids per home. So there's uh, approximately 110 families in this county that are impacted. And how can, we, how can we as a church do that? This is what I wanted to talk about. This is a ministry called Families Count. This is a six-week biblically-based parenting curriculum. This is aimed at at-risk moms and dads who are, uh, who are in jeopardy of their family breaking up or their family's already broken up and they're seeking to get their kids back. And the beauty of this is this is... Um, this teaches this Imago Dei, this God-given family structure. We're able to, to have a state-approved curriculum that is infused with the gospel and with the Bible. This is crazy, right? State and Bible, they don't seem like they would go together, but they actually do. It's in partnership with DHR. So the church gets to partner with DHR. The church gets to partner with the government, and the government says, yes, we approve. This is, all right, stay with me because it gets even crazier. This is facilitated all by the local church. This is not, facil this is not a program that's facilitated by Lifeline. This is a, a program that, that the local church says we will host this. We will minister to the moms and dads. We will do this ministry not only to moms and dads but to the families and to DHR. It's a beautiful open door for gospel ministry right here in your own community. And the target is these at-risk moms and dads who have said, uh, we want our children back or we want our family to stay together. The key component to this that judges love and that DHR loves is mentorship. So what we, what we say is this is actually discipleship of these moms and dads. This is church members walking side by side, one-on-one -on -one with Moms and dads who are in jeopardy of either losing custody of their children or have already lost custody of their kids and they want them back. What we get to see with this is, is Jesus doing so many different things. Go back just one second. We get to see, we've seen Jesus do so many things in this ministry through this Bible-based parenting cur curriculum, through partnership with DHR, through teaching the gospel, through being facilitated by the local church, and targeting these moms and dads, these folks that, that honestly a lot of times we walk right past and, and think, wow, someone should minister to them. Someone should take the gospel on the proverbial other side of the tracks. 
guess what, church? If you participate in Families Count, the other side of the tracks comes to you because it's done right here in the building. We get mom and dad used to coming, to coming to church. And it can be any time, any day that you would like to do it if you chose to do this ministry. It's three hours at a time. We give mom and dad a, a meal. Every time that they get together, we, we offer transportation and we take care of child care. Those three things, what do you think those represent? The most common excuses why not to participate in something. So we're taking care of all the excuses. And it is just great to see the church come together to do this. Um, a quick story in this, the, just a representation of what we have seen. Uh, there was a class in Tuscaloosa that just wrapped up a couple of weeks ago. There was a mom and a dad who were not married go through this class together. They've had their kids removed from their custody. But they're going through this class together in order to get custody of their children back. Neither of them knowing who Jesus is before they walk into this class. At the end of six, the six weeks, Jesus had saved both of them. But watch this. In that redemption, convicted the dad of how they had been living. They were living together. At graduation, which happens at the end of week six every single time, they're being introduced. Mom gets introduced, and she's standing over here. The dad gets introduced. He gets his certificate, right? This is a great, joyous occasion. Guess what dad does? He gets on a knee, and he proposes to mom. And he says, Jesus has saved us, and I've become convicted of how we're living, and we need to make it right before him. Salvation happens. Life transformation happens. We're awaiting word that, these, that, that kids are restored back to mom and dad. But let me tell you, this is just a small sample of what Jesus has done through this ministry of Families Count, and we are so thankful for that. And, and as I said, this is a great opportunity for partnership there. The next thing that we have is a ministry called Heritage Builders, and this is a ministry to teens in foster care who are uh, on the verge of aging out or becoming independent. We call it Independent Living Program. So this is a ministry aimed at them that the local church facilitates. We have Advocates, which is kind of a... It's a, it's a synonym for mentor, but they asked us not to use the word mentor because these, these kids have enough mentors in their life, right? We want to advocate in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a teen to a church member. And, and this is another discipleship opportunity. The next thing that we see in Heritage Builders is it, it is an opportunity to provide life readiness trainings. When these kids age out of foster care, are they ready to take on life and what life has to throw at them? As we know, as we go as we leave the nest, there are so many things that look different. And we want to help these kids be trained and ready to go as they, as they leave this system to have life readiness trainings, things like budgeting, which is such a key need. Things like how to cook, where to go to find a job. How do I find a job? How do I apply for a job? All these things that revolve around what life really is. <clears throat> we serve as a connection to resources for these teens, these young adults. We don't want to necessarily be their answer for everything, but we want to show them where to get answers. We teach them how to be resourceful in the community. And, and again, this is, this is just a great opportunity for discipleship and teaching. Okay? And we see ongoing ministry to DHR. Um, through this program, but also this is an ongoing ministry to, to group homes and to foster homes as well. So great opportunity here to support and wrap around and, and, and become a functional part of, uh, of ministry to not only DHR, but to the families and to the homes, the community group homes that may exist um, in or around the area. And there are so many ways to be involved from set up to mentorship or advocacy, excuse me, see I used the wrong word, to being a part of a life readiness training and budgeting. Maybe you have great financial skills. Maybe you don't have great financial skills, then please don't teach the budgeting class. Maybe you have a great ways to, to, to teach how to cook something. Maybe you're a grill master and you want to show kids how to use a grill or how to, how to bake cookies, something some way to be involved. There are all kinds of ways to be involved. So overall, what can we do to be involved in caring for vulnerable children and families and, and foster families and, and adoptive families? Um, first thing we can do is we can pray. That's the, that is the, the least and the greatest thing that we can do. 
is that we can pray. We can pray for the kids that are in these, these systems. We can pray for the 140 to 153 million kids across the globe that are considered orphaned. That number is staggering because if we think about it long enough, we can break that down to say those are 140 to 153 million uh, faces, names, and stories. Those are 153 million souls. We need to be prayer. We need to be prayerful for them. And if we break it even farther, we can, we can take 153 million kids, we can put them into a college football stadium that happens to reside in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, we can put them in that stadium 1,500 plus times without turning that turnstile twice. We can support those families and those kids through RAP Ministries, which is an a acronym that we use for wrestling and prayer, respite care, acts of service, and promises of God. It's a support ministry to foster families. And I will tell you, as a foster family, we love support ministries. Uh, statistically speaking, foster families without support last less than a year in the system. But with support, that number greatly increases. Offer foster families a night out. Offer mom and dad a date night. My, my, wife, my wife and I took our first date night when we started in foster care, and we sat in silence because it was the most beautiful sound that we had heard in months. <laughs> Offer this to your foster families and adoptive families and, and just families in general. Um, you can take them dinner. As we entered foster care this time, we had three girls, 9, 10, and 11 siblings that were brought into our home, and uh, wow, did we, not, did we underestimate what we were getting. But nonetheless, these group of friends came around us and they provided dinner for us twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, for five or six weeks. And it was fantastic because they would bring dinner, they'd set it on the table, they'd pray with us. And then the best part, they would leave and they would let us eat because it was, and I don't say that to be rude, I say that because what they recognized was that was the time for us to get to know each other. Right around the dinner table. Simple things, picking up groceries, all of those. Share. You can share about the needs. Share about ways to be involved. Share about the fact that there are 119 kids in, in need of care in Christian mission-minded homes here in your county. Another way you can get involved is to learn. Learn about these things. Ignorance is not bliss. We need to learn about the problems, the, the issues at hand, and we need to learn about ways to, to, to meet the needs that exist. Another way we can get involved is we can donate. We can donate to ministries that are participating in, uh, in, in orphan care or caring for vulnerable children. That can be Lifeline. It can be another ministry. It could be donating things, uh, uh, material goods to kids that are in care. Donate something. Be, a, be an active part. The last thing you can do is you can volunteer. Volunteer with, with, with local DHR. Opportunities to be transport, to be a mentor for these kids. Volunteer with, with different agencies and different organizations as a way to say, hey, I really want to be involved. This will help me learn more. Sorry, there's one more, isn't there? Is there one more point? Nope, there is not another point. But I will tell you this, another way to do this is to advocate. Advocate for those needs. Advocate for, for kids that are in care. Advocate for foster families. Advocate for ministries, opportunities. You can also visit lifelinechild.org slash next steps, and that'll show you ways as a family, as an individual, and as a church to get involved. Ways that you can, you can meet the need. Ways that you can live to James 1.27, that religion that's pure and undefiled before God our Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And that word to visit means to take on their burdens, to make their burdens your own and to make them your own. And we can do this through, through this. And we, our, our goal is to equip you to be able to do that so that there is, there is a known first step, next step, and beyond different resources that we have. I have a table set up in the breezeway right down here. I'd love to, love to talk with you some more about ways that you could potentially be involved in caring for orphans, vulnerable children, and families, foster families. You can see my email on the screen, tim.christ at lifelinechild.org, or give us a call. I'd love to chat with you some more about that. Thank you so much, Marshall, for letting me come in today, and thank you, church, for, for being patiently attentive uh, as, as we speak through some different ways to be involved in the different needs that we have. So thank you again. Uh, for allowing me to be with you today, Marshall. We, uh, we ground all these things in the gospel message that we have. Uh, we have a, a saying that floats around this church, a vision, a picture, a reality, 
at work and percolating among First Baptist Church for several years now. At First Baptist Church, we care about orphans. And some of us are going to bring children into our homes as family. And the rest of us are going to find ways to serve and support them. And so really just to tie up, uh, kind of put a bow on what Tim has shared for us and then uh, leave some time for you to talk with him after the service, uh, I just want to just give you a phrase and, uh, and really just kind of break it down into two parts. Uh, share our commitment to caring for orphans under, under two headings. So it would be under the phrase, everyone can do something. Everyone can do something. So everyone can. Did you know that the gospel of Jesus tells us that if we are children of God by faith in Jesus, do you know the gospel of Jesus tells us that we're his children? It's because we're his adopted children through Jesus. There are no natural-born children of God. To be a child of God means you were adopted, you were born spiritual orphans, Sinners into a spiritual orphanage, our fallen world, yet loved and invited into the family of God. You were given his name. You were drenched in the Father's love. You were secured in your future and in your inheritance. So there's a beauty in the gospel knowing that God is an adoptive father. Galatians 4, 4 through 5. But when the time set had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. uh, Romans 8, 15 through 16. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And so if we think about those two at one time, Galatians 4, uh, we're invited to stand in awe of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. So the eternal Son of God, condescending, stepping into deep, deep, the deepest broken situation to redeem, to loosen chains, to rescue, to give a new story forever. And the Bible calls Jesus entering this world. It says the purpose of Jesus entering at that time was to adopt you as children. I love Psalm 115.3. It says, God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. Sometimes we do things as people because we feel guilty about it. Sometimes we do it because of manipulation. Sometimes we do it because of social pressure. God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. And what has he been pleased to do? To reach out, to reach down, to redeem. Anyone can get in on it. This is the Father's heart. Everyone who's weary, everyone who's mourning, everyone who is wondering if God even cares, everyone who is failing, everyone who's a sinner God delights to adopt through the work of Jesus Christ. So anyone can get in on it. And everyone can do something. So everyone can. You know, it's been a year or two now, uh, but there was a moment uh, when our children asked me a really difficult question right before bedtime. Um, I think they asked their mom hard questions. She says, ask your dad. So then they asked me the following night. And they ask, you know, why did God allow Adam and Eve even to sin? Why did God even allow that sin would be brought into this world? Wouldn't it just be better if he just not done that? And I'm like, that's a really good question. Ask your mother. Um, No, but the answer for them included something like this. Like, in God's wondrous wisdom, God knew the importance of freedom. And he knew that love that has no choice is not love at all. So God wants our love, God expects our love, God demands our love even, but what kind of love? Freely, willingly chosen, responsive love to him. I'm going to say this, to say everyone can is not everyone must or die, but you can. To act upon God's care to care for orphans is not merely a matter of duty or guilt or idealism. It is first a response to the good news of Jesus. It is a response to the gospel. It is a willingness to mirror the Father's heart. But it's an invitation. It is an invitation, but it's a weighty invitation, isn't it? It comes to us as sons and daughters of God who have been adopted. It comes to us that we're invited to willingly bear his image, to willingly reflect his character, to to willingly walk in his deeds. It is also a challenging invitation. And if you dive into this, you will fear getting in over your head Uh, You will fear what you cannot do, but you can, because you're in Christ. And you don't have what it takes, but Christ does. And so Romans 8 comes washing over us again. 
It tells us about this spirit of adoption as sons. The spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. We don't shrink back in fear. So now, even now, the Holy Spirit is preaching the gospel to you. The Spirit tells you you are adopted as God's children. Now run with it. Never lose an inch in fear. Never shrink back. You are God's child by a miracle of God's grace, and you are God's child living in God's world. Press on. Everyone can do something. Biblically speaking, it is a mistake. Uh, to It is not okay to mistake a compassionate feeling for a fitting response to the righteous life that God calls us to. It is a mistake to confuse spiritual insight with actual change. Sometimes we say things like this, I went to worship today and God really spoke to me. Well, what did you do? Well, I sang a song that says, wherever you lead, I'll, wherever you lead, I'll go. Okay, what? You know, <laughs> you had a feeling, you sang a song. Can you imagine a scene in my home? Uh, in our house, we do share the responsibility of a loving household, Uh, with the kids, and so can you imagine, Smithy's a good sport about these things, can you imagine if I told Smithy to clean his room, all right, and hours pass by, and then Smithy is asked by Jill Curry, "Uh, did you clean your room today? Your dad told you to a few hours ago, and Smith answers something like this, you know, dad really spoke to me today, and she would say to him, about what? About cleaning my room. And in my, heart, in my heart really went out to all the action figures, and my heart went all, out to all the dirty shirts and the floor, and man, I really connected with the heart of Dad who wants to restore the tidiness in this chaotic house. But did you do anything? No. That's brave. That's brave, isn't it? It's absurd, but it's brave. The Bible tells us to be righteous, to be right with God and to be setting every other relationship right. So it does, the gospel does call us to personal righteousness, that as God has redeemed us, as God restores our broken relationship with him, as we enter into faith with him, we become these righteous people, we become someone who restores what sin has broken. So yes, personal righteousness, the journey of salvation and sanctification as the Lord himself you know, engages with our hearts, that we become people who are compassionate and fair and healing and elevating and grace-filled and merciful and loyal and kind. So we pursue that sort of righteousness within. We become holy people. But really the full scope of righteousness is to be setting every other relationship right as well. There's also a vision for public righteousness. That's what James 1.27 tells us, that religion that is pure and undefiled before, the, before God the Father is this. And we usually just go to the end to keep oneself unstained from the world, but he says it's this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So righteous people see what the Father sees. So we see vulnerable families, we see vulnerable children, we see orphans, and righteous do what the Father does. That's the invitation. And it just means that we can do something. At First Baptist Church, we care, for, we care about orphans. Some of us are going to bring children into our homeless families. The rest of us are going to find ways to serve and support them. There's a really poignant scene in the movie The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey. If you're not really into fantasy stuff, that's okay. You can kind of track for a second. Uh, the, the elf queen, Galadriel, asked Gandalf why he chose such a small and thoroughly unimpressive creature as Bilbo Baggins, a hobbit, to play a central role in the great quest to vanquish a dragon and reclaim the kingdom under the mountain. So here's the question. She asked Gandalf, why the halfling? Why this little person? And Gandalf says this, Saruman believes it is only great power that can hold great evil in check. But that is not what I have found. I have found it is in the small things, everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay, simple acts of kindness and love. And that answer reflects the power of God in the Christian story. You remember the, you know, the story of the Bible? There's a man of faith, Abraham, who's just called to leave his home and to follow a promise. The little things, you know, a shepherd boy who becomes a king, a pregnant teenage virgin, a 
Bethlehem stable and fishermen who are disciples. Everyone's something is not the same, but it is a glorious something in the economy of God. Now, Tim will be here in our first floor walkway after the service. Stop by and talk to him. We're going to leave some space for you to do that this morning. But it's an incredible opportunity he spoke to us about this morning. Like, What if we had an in with families in our county? I mean, families in our church right now who are foster parents are walking through this reality, this fearfulness, this dread, this anxiety of what happens to children when they go back home because we fear the cycle repeating itself. What if the church had an end? What if we had a gospel end for vulnerable families? And what if that rescue just looked differently for us? We can engage that. That something could be that we just, we just still continue to be the church that loves the fatherless and the cab. We pray for those who work in our child welfare system. We have those members in our church as well. We host our classes here that, that train uh, foster parents. We've been a church that's advocated for the, the, the DHR system in our county. We've responded to needs. We've made up hundreds of duffel bags to get placed in the laps of children who come into foster care on their very first day. It's no small thing. In our church, we have a wraparound support system for foster families and adoptive families, people that sort of like gospel-given grandparents wrap around foster families to pray for them, to offer relief, to serve them, to encourage them. You've been so faithful in that. If that sounds new to you, ask me about it after the service. I'd love to invite you into that. And of course, I will always put in our laps and your laps that we need among our congregation foster parents and adoptive parents so that every child in our county has an ideal placement and every waiting child has a home. Listen, the heart of the gospel, I say to you, the heart of the gospel is family giving. It is not family worshiping. It is not family protecting. It is not family idealizing. It is family giving. We have an adoptive father as a father. So for our church, listen, as long as we have houses with rooms in them, and as long as we have people who understand the gospel and worship the Lord, we have potential for more families like this. Don't skip over it. Just pray about it. We end with Hebrews eleven eight again. Abraham obeyed. He was called to go out to a place. He was to receive an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. We don't know the outcomes, do we? Abraham didn't. We don't play the outcomes. We don't play the pros and cons and weigh out the bottom lines. Abraham no, had no idea this, of the significant things that he would walk through, the good things along the journey, the challenging things. It just unfolded as he went. Our move always as followers of Jesus Christ. Our move is faithfulness. Our move is to act from our identity and move from there. So what would an adopted child of God do? What would someone do who knows that he is God's child living in God's world? What is it that we do for those who know the Father's heart? How do we respond? Everyone can do something. And maybe, just maybe this morning, in all these words and all these pieces put together, you heard the gospel of adoption clearly. I want you to know you can be adopted by the Father in heaven as well. Would you trust Jesus Christ this morning? We're going to pray, and we're going to sing a song of response. Roger, if you would, let's just sing one, one stanza of that, uh, and then we'll, we'll be dismissed in a way that you could spend some time talking with Tim afterward before going to Sunday school. You'll, you'll come and lead us, and I'll pray. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for loving us and bringing us into your family. We thank you for the open invitation to join in the delight and the joy of the Father. Father, help us to see it as a joy and a delight and not as anything else. We pray this in your name. Amen. Sure enough, I invite you to uh, stand and we'll sing the first stanza of Speak, O Lord.
may be seated. As we go out of worship this morning, I want to invite you into a few things. Uh, first, uh, you're invited as you are each week uh, as an extension of our worship to give of your tithes and of your offerings. Those offering plates are located behind you in the foyer, and so thank you for generously giving uh, throughout the year. Uh, Golden Circle uh, will meet this week at Cracker Barrel, no, Sweet Home, Sweet Home, I wrote that note down wrong. Um, as, as I said out loud, I realized that. If you want to ride the bus, you meet here at 1030 on Tuesday, or you can meet there at Sweet Home at 11. Uh, this week, because of the Thanksgiving holiday, there's no Wednesday night activities here on our campus and no Wednesday night meals, and our office will be closed Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday as well. You see in your bulletin, if you have that, opportunities to give toward Angel Tree. There's information for that. There's also ways to give of a food bag. They're out there in the foyer, and you usually find those throughout the, throughout the church building as well. Angel Tree is an opportunity to buy gifts to bless the family, bless children this Christmas season by buying their Christmas gifts, uh, and then the food boxes and food bags that go along with that. So two opportunities there. Uh, also in your bulletin, you'll see that there's some upcoming things for our children's ministry. Uh, our children's choir will be singing on December something 4th, December 4th. Uh, and then, of course, there's a Bethlehem brunch following our worship. Uh, you'll read about that as well for our children on December 4th as well. And let me invite you to this. Come back tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, Rachel Pacuary, who's a licensed professional counselor who was with us earlier in the spring. She's back with us this evening. Uh, she's going to talk to us about emotional and spiritual health, uh, something that I think will make the light bulbs of our minds and of our hearts go off. And so come back here at 6 p.m. Uh, for that talk tonight uh, and that time to be able to learn and be equipped and grow together. All right, that's all I've got for you from your bulletin. If you would, stand with me, and we'll speak and pray our benediction as we go out this morning. And again, please take a few moments to stop by and talk to Tim. He'll be here after the service. May the beauty of God be reflected in our lives, the love of God be reflected in our hands, the wisdom of God be reflected in our words, and the knowledge of God flow from our hearts that all might see and sing, believe. Grace and peace. Thank you.